to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be turning to the book um, of Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Um, as we will examine a few verses from chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. Philippians chapter 1, 2 through 11. Um, they say that rain is a sign of blessing. <clears throat> I'm just guessing we are the most blessed people in the entire world. The other night it was just a torrential downpour and somehow... Um, The rain was seeping into our basement somehow, and I was reminding my wife how blessed we are as a family. Um, I know it seems kind of like cold and dark and gray out there, um, but I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad that uh, where you are sitting, the leak got fixed. It was directly above your head, Carter, uh, this week. And so we are just blessed in amazing ways. Um, I love this idea, what we want to expand upon this morning. It's so relevant to where we are at as a local church and where I am trusting the Lord continue to lead us as we seek to impact the community that God has called us to be a part of for His glory. I want to pray first and foremost and just ask that God would direct and lead and speak to us uh, through His Word. Would you bow your heads, please? And pray with me. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge um, your reign and your rule over us. Father, I thank you for every single person that is here. I thank you, Lord, for these few moments that you have given to us to be together in your house on your day to focus on you. Father, I thank you that we have been created in your image. And although, Lord, in our own hearts, as we just sang about, we are prone to wander, I thank you, Lord, that you you came to get us, to bring us unto yourself by offering the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we have such hope through the message of the gospel. I thank you, Lord, that you regularly regularly remind us of the power that exists, that lives can always be transformed so that each one of us can reflect your image and be conformed, not to the things of this world, but to the things of you. Father, I I just pray right now for help clarity of thought and and speech. I pray, Lord, for listeners that are here, that you, in your unique and powerful way, uh, would allow your word to come alive and plant plant truth into our hearts and allow our hearts to produce fruit that are pleasing to you. Uh, Father, I do pray, Lord, for this church that you've called us to be a part of, and we rejoice in what you are doing, but we also know that there's great, great responsibility on every one of us. I would ask, Lord, that we would understand what that is so that we can be obedient to you, that we can live for your glory, for your glory, and for your glory alone. Uh, May you speak, and may your servants hear. We ask this in the strong and powerful name of our Savior. Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We have a vision statement that I know that you have heard and you've heard and you've heard. Um, We exist um, to build relationships so that God is glorified and lives, homes, and families are transformed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's something that we have been very, very vocal about. Hopefully every single person, in a sense, understands why we are here. There there is, though, um, something recently, it was really in our time that we spent together as elders, was was kind of revealed to us. It's very easy, I know it is for me, to assume that people perhaps are a little bit further along uh, than they really are. It, It happens... I would say as frequently and as easily as when I say the words, 
Would you take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of Mark, Malachi, Luke, Lamentations. And then you notice that some people are like, so where and what is a lamentation? There's this idea that, that sometimes we automatically assume that we just um, know, think that everyone else knows exactly where we are, where we want to go. And, and I've realized in ministry that it doesn't really, it doesn't happen. Like, in life, it doesn't happen like that. A number of years ago, I was coaching, I love to coach Little League, and the little guys in my, my son Seth was little at the time, and he was playing center field. And you know those coaches can get a little loud and aggressive once in a while, and they weren't listening. Can you believe that? Nine-year-old boys were not listening to their coach. And, and I remember I was hitting fly balls out to the outfield, and, and, and I'm, yelling, I'm yelling at my son, hit the cutoff, man, hit the cutoff, man, like repeatedly, like I've said this a thousand times. And Seth kind of came running in halfway, and he goes, all right, Dad, I, I will, but, but what's a cutoff, man? And the idea is, is, is that we just assume that people automatically are like, they're, they're engaged, they're locked in. And in all honesty, you've lived busy lives, and you come here, you sit down for a few moments, and I'm like, okay, turn the book up, and as if, and, and there's a lot of movement and activity that happens. And so when it comes to our vision, I think that there's an idea, and we've prayed about this, where we have to kind of pause and we take a closer look. We kind of look through the bushes a little bit and see exactly what is it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pack that over the next couple of weeks. We'll take some break. I know there's Mother's Day coming up, and moms, don't worry. We're going to have an amazing, like, attention towards you. But, but, but we're going to look specifically at this. What I decided to do is we have this, this vision statement that is everywhere, all over the place with big woods, that we exist to build relationships. And I thought about, you know what, I think we're assuming that people can build relationships when, when in all honesty, some people don't know how to do that. They don't really know what it means to build relationships with a purpose in mind of what connecting people to the gospel so their lives can be transformed. And so that's really what we want to do for a few minutes this morning is we're going to talk about how we actually build relationships. How do we do this right? And there's an example that's given to us, and, and I've purposely turned to the book of Philippians because there's, there's a man here who, who got it. He, he got it, and he got it right. Let's just, let's just go to, like, the greatest preacher, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Apostle Paul veteran missionary, church planter, uh, communicator, extraordinaire. Um, he just does it all. And he gives to us here a picture of what relationships should look like so we can learn from this morning. Pick it up with me. I'll, I'll read Philippians chapter 1, begin in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is, it is, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you all are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. 
Now, there is so much here. There are so many terms of affection. If we had the time, we could just continue to read uh, verse 12. I want you to know. Paul is so... Con- I want you to know what happened to me is really served to advance the gospel. In chapter 2, Therefore, my beloved, because you have always obeyed, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 17 of Philippians chapter 2, I am glad... And I rejoice with you all. Chapter 4, Therefore, my brothers whom I love and I long for. Chapter 4, verse 14, It was kind of you to share my trouble. Chapter 4, verse 18, I am well supplied having received the gifts that you said. There's just, there's just phrase after phrase of affection. And I want you to know this. I love you and I'm thankful for you and I'm grateful for you. We don't have the time to look at all of that, but let's just unpack a few of these verses and learn how we do relationships. If we're to build relationships, well, I want to learn how to do this, to do this right. Let me set the scene a little bit here, okay? There's a man, this time Paul is probably in his late 60s. I think he's probably got a scraggly kind of a beard. He sits with his knees pulled up to his Chin, and he's leaning against a rough, cold stone wall. He doesn't have any shoes on his feet. He's actually quite dirty. The shirt that he has on is more like a it's more like a burlap bag with a couple holes cut out of it for his head and for his arms. And the place that he's sitting is cold, and it stinks of must and mildew. It's 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 it's, it's damp. It's dark. It's so dark that you almost have to squint a little bit to see him. But when you see him, you can't help but notice there's, there's kind of like a little flashing of his teeth. Like you actually can see that although it's dark, he's smiling while he is sitting there. A smile. Wait a minute. There's a, there's a sparkle. There's a sparkle in his eyes. There's, there's a face that if you were to focus that his face almost serves as a window to what? To a heart that is just bursting with contentment with his surroundings. His heart is bursting with with satisfaction and a sense of of joy. And you're like, wait a minute, joy? Like, how how can that be? Here is a man in, in such dire circumstances. And yet in all honesty... Unlike you and I sitting there, he's completely happy. He, he's, he's sitting there and he's alone, but in a sense, he's not really alone. And you're like, well, how, like, how does that work? It works because the Apostle Paul gives to us an example, a model of what relationship looks like. That, that, that the Lord ultimately is the source of his joy. And God, the Lord, in his sovereignty, allowed Paul to be surrounded with certain people. And, and we, we have to learn, we must learn how to do this and how to do this well. Now, now we, we know that Paul, this is probably towards the very, very end of his life. When he sits in, in this particular prison cell, it's probably the Mamertine prison in, in, in Rome, somewhere between 60 to 62 A.D. It's literally referred to as the house of darkness. I mean, it was a horrid, horrid, hard place to be. Either way you look at it, we know that Paul is separated not only miles, with, with, with miles from his friends in Philippi, but he's been separated for months from them. And yet, although it's been a distance of both time, we know that there's still something that exists. In his heart, deep in his soul, there's a friendship, there's a fellowship, there's a relationship that allows him to endure what he is in the midst of. We, we would do well, I would do well, to be reminded of how to do relationship like this. I know that some of you automatically, the critics and skeptics, are like, wait a minute here, wait a minute here. Building relationships within the community means that we're building relationships with unsaved people. Wait a minute. Paul's writing to save his brothers and sisters in Christ. 
correct, very observant of you. I'm so thankful for your cynicism. Th- think about this. Think about this. Where do we want to go for our examples of how to build relationships? Do we want to go to the Word or do we want to go to the world? Do, do, I, do I want to learn how to build relationships from like the one who has designed us or do I want to listen to some of the philosophical emptiness and nothingness that exists in this world? I want to go to the ideal. That's where I want to begin. When you're teaching your child how to, to, to shoot a a basketball into the basket. You don't be, you don't, you're not like, well, as long as you get close, that's all right. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to like get it in. You're teaching your little one how to hit a target with his first little BB gun. It's not like just, just, just hopefully get it that direction. <laughs> no, you start with there's the center, there's the middle, there's the bullseye. That's perfection. That's what we're shooting for. That's why we go directly to this example of Paul in relationships with his brothers and sisters in Christ. Three things I want to give you. The first one is this. Paul models for us that we should have other people on our minds. Number one, we should, we should always have other people on our minds. Listen to what Paul says in verse 3. He says, I thank my God in all of my remembrance. He's sitting in this cell and he's writing, he's penning this letter, and he can't help but remember who these people are. Sorry. There's, this, there's, this, there's a scene here that is nothing less than remarkable. Who is Paul, a former Pharisee? What's a Pharisee? A person who's constantly concerned about himself, his own presentation, his own appearance. He's a narcissist. And yet here, he's not concerned the least about himself. He's only concerned with other people. This is, what, this is a veteran pastor, preacher, church planter, as I said. And although he is literally awaiting his trial, he's chained probably to a wall, staring at this wet piece of moldy bread in front of him for his dinner. He can't help but have his mind and his memory go back to these people where every single thought, every remembrance of them brings a smile on his face. Those ones in Philippi were precious to him. Like, wait a minute, but do you know what happened when he was in Philippi? He was arrested, he was beaten, arrested illegally. He was put in stocks. He was humiliated. So so the place has nothing to do with it. It's the people that are there. And he can't help but, but go back to the time that he was in that prison cell in Philippi. The Philippian jailer, remember that? The Philippian jailer was about to, to commit suicide, to run himself through with a sword. And, and, and Paul says, oh, well, we're here. Don't worry. He recalls and he recounts the time that the Philippian jailer went home and, and shared the good news of the gospel with his entire family. And the whole family got baptized. They're the memories that he has. The proprietor of Purple, Lydia, Remember the gal who opened up her beautiful, probably almost opulent home to anyone. Come in and sit and fellowship. And it's thoughts and memories of that person that causes a smile to break across his face. That poor little little girl who had been possessed by a demon, the horror of seeing her, and yet the joy of knowing that she was forever freed by the work and through the work of the Holy Spirit. So when there's individual people that comes to Paul's mind when he thinks about them and remembers them, he what? He has joy that bubbles up. I thought about you and I. If someone were to think of you, someone away, someone separated, someone apart, and they think of you with, with your personality, your gifts, your worries, your strengths, whatever it is, do, do, do you think that people, when they pause on you for a moment, do you think a sense of joy comes to their heart, to their mind, or do you think it's more of a sense of, oh boy, I hope I don't run into them at the grocery store? What, what is it? I think it's worth asking that. We talk about relationships. It goes both directions. 
One of the greatest privileges I think I have as a pastor, I had the opportunity doing it, doing it just last night in a, uh, sitting in a home of a family from our church. This past week I was in another home, and, and, and people in their homes have pictures. And, and what I love, you can learn so much. Just, just, you know, just the refrigerator usually has enough pictures, and you can begin to say, well, who's this right here? And who's this? And they look just like, and as they begin to explain well, who this is, and this is my nephew, and my nephew just got married, and this is the one who's graduating from college, and this is the one, and you see what happens. And faces, literally, literally, faces just light up. Like, I've not seen my uncle like there. That's, like, that's the man who taught me. And I thought about that idea that we, we have got to strive for that, people think of us. We know it was a positive relationship. There's a clear indicator as to why the Philippians were so dear to Paul. Verse 6, it says what? He who began a good work. Paul says, I'm confident the Holy Spirit is still at work. He who began it is going to finish this. And it says very specifically, he who began a good work. Well, what is a good work? Well, apparently it's a work that's good. It's kindness. It's perhaps what? Sharing something. I I only have one here, but I'm going to break it so we can each enjoy it. It's it's good works. Perhaps it's a word of encouragement. I I I in my early years of ministry I kept a shoebox, an old Nike shoebox, underneath my bed, and when I would receive a card, I'd put it in that shoebox just Someone, if I was able to, to marry a young couple, if I was able to be alongside of a family uh, um, um, during a funeral or during the loss of a loved one, I'd take that note and I'd put it into my shoebox. And what I quickly realized is that that shoebox wasn't big enough and you had to get another shoebox. And I'd add it to that and add it to that. And do you realize the words of encouragement literally spur what, not just me on to ministry. Those words of encouragement go both directions. Do you realize the weight of your words? And I think that that's, that's another idea that Paul says, well, I know your heart. I, I know the good work that God is doing. He's going to continue to do that. This goes both directions. That There's, there's, there's a moment here we ask and we examine When we search our own heart, do you have other people on your mind? If it's just you, if it's just you and you're concerned about, like, you, uh, I tell you what, it'll be a desperate, lonely life. We'll never accomplish, we will never accomplish what I believe God has called us to do and the impact that we can have in this community if all you're ever thinking about is you. If all I'm ever thinking about is me. Secondly, not only should we have people in our minds, we should have other people in our hearts. Paul says this, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. Now, this is more than a sappy line from a Valentine card. Okay, this is like, this is real here. This moves deeper than even our minds. It moves, what, to the emotion. I believe it's possible even to have people in our minds without having them in our hearts. I think that's possible. I don't know who said it, but they said it quite well. Many people today have to confess, I have you on my nerves. I think that's actually true. Like, that's not what we're looking for, okay? Like, yeah, I got you on my nerve. That's, that's not it. Paul is speaking about what? Sincere love. Agape, love. Not a feeling of emotion that raises up and down, but what? A commitment to act. A commitment towards that person. Something deep. It, it's something that's what? It cannot be disguised. True love is going to be witnessed. It's going to bubble up. It's going to be evidence and proof of a real Christian. 
if you don't have a love for other people, John writes it like this in 1 John in chapter 3 and verse 14. This is how pivotal it is. It says, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Do you realize what John is saying here? John, the one whom Jesus loved, he kept calling himself. In, in, in a sense, they're saying what? This is an indicator of the fact that you have been passed from death You were on a path of destruction to life. And now it it, it happens. It pours out. The Holy Spirit produces this in amazing ways. So again, we stop and we pause and we ask, do you have people on and in your heart? Or do you just have yourself again in your heart? Earlier in Paul's letter, Paul's letter that he writes to the Corinthians in chapter 13, we know an entire chapter that is dedicated towards this subject. Paul says what? And there's this long list. You can have knowledge. You can be brilliant. He says that you can have amazing gifts. He says you can give everything that you have to poor people, like be on the top of the donor list somewhere. You can know how to sacrifice. You can have faith. But notice the terminology. If you do not have love, what does it say in in, in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Very carefully, then you are nothing. I don't know about you, but that's that's like pretty strong language. You can have this, 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 but if you don't have if you don't possess this, zero. Like, that's, this is not my words telling you. This is what the Word of God... If you don't possess this in a genuine, sincere way towards others, if you don't love and care, concern for those around you, then according to what it says in Scripture, you are nothing. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, Tim, I surrounded you with people and all you did was, was what show concern for your own well-being. Your own contentment. I don't want to do that. Notice as well, we were joking about this as we were praying on on, um, Friday morning, that you see uh, four times, even in the few verses that we read, and you see it actually nine times throughout the book of Philippians that that Paul keeps using the terms, you all. Like, you all are in my my prayers. You all are in my. We're like, was he from like down south or what, y'all? But the idea is what? He doesn't want to miss anyone. You understand that? Like you all, like just in case, I am making sure that every person is covered here. We're not going to miss anyone. You all. Do do you love like a select few? Or do you love all? That's really what he's talking about. Can Can I confess sadly in my life, there are some people that are really, really easy to love. And there are some people that are really hard to love. I, and I know that I, <laughs> to other people, and for, I'm maybe one of those guys, that, yeah, he is really hard to love. And, and, and this is why we, we raise the bar of this is what it means here. Have people on our minds, have people in our hearts. Thirdly and finally, we should have other people in our prayers. We see this twice, verse 4, that you always in every prayer of mine. Verse 9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound abound more and more. Paul found this, that, that, that he found joy in his memories of other people. And in his growing love for them, and the way that in a sense there's this fresh relationship that although it's been miles and months, that 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 he's still praying for them. In indication of people being on our minds, in indication of people being in our hearts, is the fact that their names regularly pass through our lips or are on our minds as we approach the throne of grace in prayer, in indication of that. 
So that if, if that if a person that you truly care about is not being lifted up before the Lord in prayer, then guess what? They're probably not there. You're telling yourself, but they're really not there. This is what? This is what Paul's talking about. That this is this is the way, this is the means of how he keeps them close to his heart. All kinds of prayer items specifically that your love may abound more and more that you would approve things that are excellent. I'm praying that you would be sincere. I'm praying that you would be blameless. I'm praying that you would be filled with fruits of the Holy Spirit. We see this throughout the, throughout the entire book, that Paul is actively, faithfully involved. So begin to say, okay, well, this relationship thing here, this is, yeah, this is a little bit more difficult than I thought, like in my mind and on my heart. How are we doing here? What I have discovered is I have the privilege, really I have like the best seat in the house to watch ministry go on in, in several different settings throughout this local church. Just this week, an amazing treat for me um, was to speak to the junior high uh, students on Wednesday night on the importance of, they're doing a series on evangelism. I, I, I call it, uh, on Wednesday I was talking about the importance of living louds. Showing and sharing other people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we kind of came to the conclusion that it's going to be based on the relationship that these students have with other students. You realize that? That's going to make it effective witness for evangelism. Late this afternoon, a group of, of, of kids and one of the young men from our church are going to Susquehanna and, and Lock Haven, extended care to speak to them. And you know what is, you know what is helpful is that when we go back repeatedly we begin to see the same faces and we get to know names of one another. Relationships are established and what? The credibility of, of, of the message is lifted up high. I've been able to work alongside uh, Kenny and one of our elders and Pastor Josh, Matt McDermott, who are, are working as we are literally renovating our entire recovery ministry. We've come to the conclusion that you can... You, the, the curriculum itself is secondary to the fact that what is effective is what? Individual discipleship relationships. It's jumping into the trench with the person saying, you know what, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here with you. I'm going to walk with you every single day. Realize that's what is effective. Pastor Aaron's class that he's teaching on deadly doctrines, dangerous doctrines. Mark Lovin's class on how to, to share your faith. Just last week he was talking, I have to confess, he goes, some people have a hard time loving. It's all based, every ministry that we do here for effective what? Forward motion of the gospel is going to be based on relationships. Now I know that we start and we kind of talk on this casual, let's talk sports, pirates or Phillies. This is like neat fun for a while. Talk on the weather. Well, it's really raining a lot. And it kind of like it ends. Talk on, on politics and we listen to congressional or presidential decisions and it's like, wow, that's really like blah, 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 blah. In a sense, I, I want us to move to matters of significance, weightier matters. Matters of importance and relevance a thousand years from now. When we know that what? The souls of mankind and the word of the Lord are the only things, the only things that endure forever. That's where we need to move. Given to you, I know our time is quickly escaping. Let me give you a couple of really, really, really important things, practical things that you can do when, it, when we talk about, okay, so we have on, like on our minds and in our hearts and all of this, but what, what does this like look like? I'm not going to assume anything. Let me give you some things. Number one, be willing to sacrifice your time. I don't know if there's anything, anything that is more precious to you than every minute of every day. You can never get it back. Now understand this. If you're going to build relationships, you're going to understand that you have to count the cost and that relationships are expensive when it comes to the investment of your time. It can't be like 30 seconds on a wave. How you doing? Yeah, we're close. We're like, we're like this. 
That's not it. Don't lie to yourself. Don't fool yourself any longer. You have to realize that if you're going to invest in other people's lives and you're going to seek to communicate to them, then you realize that when they're ready to communicate or ready to talk or ready to ask you a question, it may be when you're not, like, interested in talking. You realize that? I don't think that every single conversation that Paul had with those in the church of Philippi or any one of the other churches that he planted, it was like only according to his schedule. I'll see you from 9.30 to 9.45 and make sure that you have a clear list of everything. I don't think it happened like that. I think that when someone knocked on his door, when someone came to him, he made time for them. You and I, if we're to establish and build relationships, we've got to be willing to sacrifice the precious moments of our day. Be willing to sacrifice your time. Secondly, be patient. And be a careful listener. Be patient and be a careful listener. What's interesting here is that listening is exhausting. Now, now, good listening, as you really stay in tune, it can wear you out. So what happens is that we begin to like nod and our eyes are beginning to, and like all you're seeing is someone's mouth move and you are like completely disengaged. I wonder what the score is to the Phillies game right now. Has that ever happened to you where your mind wanders? And what's going to happen is that you will miss opportunities when you're only half kind of tuned in. And, and remember that listening is not like the silent time that's in between you speaking. Listening is listening. Proverbs says it like this. Solomon says it like this in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2. A fool has no delight in understanding, but expressing his own heart. Another translation says what? Airing his own opinions. Let, let, let me make it very clear without trying to be rude, because you know I don't want to be rude. But if you talk more than you listen, you're missing it. If you talk more than you listen, you're not going to have very effective relationships. Listen. And listen. And when the Holy Spirit prompts you, you say what? I love the term it says that we're to speak the oracles of God, the very words of God. Everything that comes out of your mouth should be exactly the words that God himself should speak. Number three, when you do speak, be clear in your communication. Oh, how, how I strive for this and how I so desperately just bomb it so many times. And how difficult it is to be, to be what? Accurate, relevant, and clear at all times. And let me tell you what, good communication requires mental stamina. It's going to require you remaining focused and uh, avoiding the temptation of like chasing the little, the little subjects that are all over the place. That you can like chase unimportant and insignificant things. I love 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. Paul's teaching Timothy how to do this. And he says this. He says, avoid... I love the old King James. He says, avoid vain babblings. <laughs> that is like so... Like just, just, just no, nothingness. Like it is of no eternal weight or significance. Just avoid that. The NIV translates it, avoid godless chatter. It just fills up and you're not to have anything to do with that. Proverbs says a word fitly spoken at the right time and the right moment is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. I've always talked about the fact that I have no idea what that really means, an apple of gold and a pitcher of silver. I've not really seen that before, but it's a beautiful picture, a word fitly spoken. Next one, be lovingly honest. This is where at times truth must be spoken. And when we talk about the importance of the message of the gospel, you've got to get to the truth of what? You're a sinner and I'm a sinner. Like if all we ever do is stay on the peripheral, on the outside, but we never get to the heart of it, you're not being honest. You, I tell you what, people can, people can sniff out a fake a thousand miles away. And so what we have got to do is 
is strive for integrity and, and model this. Parents, I think as well, it starts with you at home, that you model absolute, unquestionable integrity in your homes. And our kids will learn that. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in them. If it's like, well, you need to believe this and you need to do this and you need to, but, but I don't have to, then you know what? Stay home because you're missing it. Lastly, be willing to admit your own sinful weaknesses. If you come at it from a high horse approach, like, yeah, someday you'll be as righteous as me or as spiritual as me, okay, you've got to admit the fact, forgive me. I was wrong. Just recently I had to go to someone and say, forgive me, my tone was just, was just so wrong. That's not, that's not what I wanted to express. Forgive me for hurting you in that way. First Peter says, "What humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God that he may exalt, he may lift up. I know that there's a lot there, and that's a lot probably in a short period of time, but it's very, very important to see what. If we're going to model the Lord Jesus Christ, this is, this is not just how Paul, the relationships, Paul was following the model of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save that which are lost. If our, if our goal is to build relationships so that lives are transformed through the gospel, then follow his truth, his word. Pray that God would give you an opportunity, even, even this week, even today, where you can put some of this listening more than talking. Absolute integrity in every word. <clears throat> A word fitly spoken. And what amazing opportunities to have other people literally I mean, you can be that person, just like Paul. When they think of you, that a, uh, 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 they can't help but a smile that 